Well, I'm very excited for our conversation. Yeah, um, me too. I ever since I I have not watched all of your episodes on the on the Persig thing. Mm -hmm. Um, just here and there a few, but then the last few, like all the bells and whistles started going off. So, <laughs> so I have tried to be uh, an avid watcher recently. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I think the, I mean, a lot of the reason I did this project was to learn about the book myself. Mm -hmm. Because even though I was really interested in his work and, and very quite certain that it um, was, you know, something that described for me something very important about the nature of existence, I, I, had to familiarize myself with it. And I realized that it wasn't going to do it just by reading the book once or twice, that I really had to get in depth. So that, that's what gave me the idea to do this. So in a way, there's a certain misleading aspect to it that I'm an expert in his work, which I'm not. It's, it's just, um, you know, I'm doing it week to week. And I think it's one of the reasons that these last ones are stronger. Number one is because he, you know, he thinks these are the strongest chapters, first of all. And secondly, I understand it better. So yeah. I think it kind of improved as it went along. So uh, thank you for watching. Well, and I think when you, when you pointed out the, uh, the Eric Tornberg summary of the book, mm -hmm. Since I hadn't watched all the episodes, that gave me a little bit more understanding of the structure and of what's happening. Because as you're unfolding it, it's obviously a book that's more like a series, almost like Inception, like a series of a dream within a dream or a story mm -hmm. within a story. There's so much going on there that um, I can imagine the book is quite a challenge to take in all at once. And in a sense, maybe... Um, he wrote it that way on purpose so that you'd have to engage the right hemisphere in order to be able to absorb it because it's it's tapping into so many different aspects of our personhood that you can't you can't get it in the same way that you get a linear book where it's one idea building on top of another idea. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think that that's exactly what he was doing because I think that um, he was very much one to demonstrate rather than explain. Now, the second book explains a lot more just out of necessity because um, what he said, and um, I probably, I don't know how much I can talk about that second book because it's still kind of baffling to me certain things about it, but the second book actually, uh, dealing, you know, actually makes the, the structure of the metaphysics of quality because he said, people are just not getting this book. Maybe they're more left brain oriented, so I've got to spell it out. But in, in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, he's very much um, the experience of, you know, I mean, his, um, his thought process unfolds and he's got these layers like, you know, there's the, the, there's the journey and then there's Phaedrus um, scholarly work and the, you know, manic, I guess you could say, pursuit of what is quality. Then there's the journey, the relationship with the sun, and then there's the relationship with the environment. Um, and I could, there's probably a couple other things and these all layer on top of each other and demonstrate what he's trying to say on, you know, four or five levels. So I think that is, that is very much a, a, a right hemisphere way of seeing things. Yeah. So, um, and I, I stumbled this morning on a, a video. It's, it's funny, the things that come around on the feed, it's almost like the algorithm knows exactly what you need at the right moment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's interesting, and, isn't it? There's an old video of uh, Jordan Peterson talking with Jonathan and Matthew Pajot about the, the overall symbolism of heaven and earth mm -hmm. and time and space and, and that whole symbolic picture that Matthew tried to put together in writing his book. And, uh, and that brought some more kind of crystallization to my thinking. But um, what it pointed out to me is that in this book by Gil McGilchrist, <clears throat> McGilchrist's book is laying out a picture of the left and right hemispheres that is much more complete than the popular conception of what the left and right hemisphere are mm -hmm. up to. And because of that, it's not a neat package of two, two ways of thinking. And, and, I mean, I think the popular conception is that the left hemisphere is analytical and the right hemisphere is emotional. And 
<clears throat> Although McGilchrist says straight up front, he says, it's not that the left hemisphere is masculine and the right hemisphere is feminine. He's not making that argument. But when I read all the things that he's put in that book to describe the differences in the way the hemispheres operate and how they operate in union with each other and how they must operate in union with each other and in competition with each other, it's a vital part of the way things operate. It sounds very much to me like a marriage. And, and the, the, um, the principles that unite a marriage and also make a, a marriage difficult <laughs> are, are kind of the same thing. Um, and that is that a marriage, in order to function at its most creative and purposeful, has to have a strict boundary of commitment. The commitment is what makes the marriage work. The commitment is also what makes the marriage difficult because a commitment feels restricting. But if that commitment is based on what um, Marcel Gabrel calls the creative fidelity, meaning that there is a, it's a such a big thing, but the, the knowing, the creative knowing of each other, the, the, the trust in each other, the trust in the intentionality of each other, um, the working back and forth with each other. If that creative fidelity is there, then the boundary of the commitment actually becomes a creative springboard. And the other way I can look at this is as an artist, I know for myself that my creativity is best expressed when I put very severe boundaries on myself. If I put a severe boundary on that says, I'm gonna do 20 paintings, I'm, I'm going to give myself the maximum opportunity for creativity, but the boundary is that all 20 paintings have to be of the same subject. Mm -hmm. The same subject on the same place in the frame, but then within that, I can do anything. If I don't have that boundary and I just say, oh, I can do anything, now I'm immobilized. Right, that <laughs> makes sense. Any choices, right? Yeah. I, I have, I, I don't know whether to move forward or backward, right mm -hmm. or left, there's too many choices. But if I create a boundary, now, now I have an aim, and now within that aim, I have maximum creativity. And so when he's talking in, uh, in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, in the beginning of uh, Torenberg's description, he says that- I'm gonna, I'm gonna click over there. Um, okay. I guess it doesn't look any different when I do this, so. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll just follow so, along. Sure, at the kind of, uh, I, it's six pages for me, so I'm at the bottom of the first page. Um, Tornberg is saying that Persig tells us there's two ways of understanding if there's a handful of sand sorted into separate piles. The classical understanding is concerned with the piles and the basis for sorting and relating them. But the romantic understanding is directed toward the handful of sand before the sorting began. Um, I think if I'm looking at the two hemispheres of the brain, that's a pretty, the classical is a pretty clear mm -hmm. description of the left hemisphere. Yeah. The yeah, left absolutely. hemisphere would be concerned with the piles and the basis for sorting and relating mm -hmm. them and probably what can be constructed out of the sand, how those pieces can be put together into something and created into something useful and productive. Mm -hmm. And the right hemisphere is close on this romantic understanding, except that I think you have to add in the, the way the romantic understanding is directed toward the handful of sand is that it is also seeing the potential. Right, I think that's a very important word, absolutely. Right? And, yeah. and the wisdom that is inherent there and the knowledge that is available and the spaces between the pieces. Mm -hmm. I think all of that is important because um, all of that is contained in the handful of sand. 
there is way more there than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. and that's the part that um, people that are very left hemisphere oriented don't tend to see. And um, I, I know this myself because I was very left hemisphere oriented before I started doing art. And the thing that got me started in doing art was that mm, I'm like turned 50 years old. I have a toddler at home because my daughter was born when I was 46. So um, for many years, I had nobody to talk to except this little one, you know, <laughs> three and four letter words. I started to lose my grasp on language. And at about the same time, I'm going through menopause. So I lost half my brain anyway. Mm -hmm. So. I couldn't articulate anything intelligent and it became extremely frustrating for me to be bound in that mm -hmm. place where I couldn't express myself. And I, at about the same time I started painting just to get out of the house once in a while and take a class. But it was through that experience later on, I took some classes in creativity where I was forced into this very strict boundary and began learning about the, the elements and principles of design. And I began to see how those elements and principles of design kind of govern everything about everything in the world, mm -hmm. not, just, not just art, not just about how you approach a work of art. What, what are some of those principles? Well, okay, so the elements are line, size, shape, direction, mm -hmm. color, value, and texture. And they're called elements because everything is made up of them. Mm -hmm. And when you do a, a work of art, there's, they're going to show up there. All those seven elements will show up in every work of art. Some people focus more on one than another. Some people are very textural painters. Mm -hmm. Some are very much linear painters. Some are more color oriented. <clears throat> then there's eight principles. And the principles are unity, harmony, contrast, dominance, repetition, gradation, variation and balance. And I'm sure some of those pop out more than others as sure. being important. Dominance, I really think is at the, to me, dominance is at the top of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the elements are here and the principles are here. So, mm -hmm. you know, it forms a frame. Yeah. Um, because none of the principles will work in creating a unified work of art if there is not something dominant. There has to be 80% of something and 15% of something else and 5% of something right. else in order to create a unified whole. But the dominance is not, the dominance is not there to call attention to itself. The dominance is there to provide a substrate of the velvet in the jewel case, so to speak, mm -hmm. and then the jewel rests on the velvet. That makes sense, yeah. So, so when you think about relationship, any per human relationship, at one point or another, one person will be dominant, but if it's done properly, the dominance that they are exercising is a dominance that is there in order to provide a support for the other person's individuality and beauty to be reflected not a dominance of control, right. but a dominance of support. Yes, yeah, sort of, sort of um, so some security, you could say. Yes, well, so for example, when a parent, so all of these things relate back to this idea of boundary. Mm -hmm. So when a, when a child does not have appropriate boundaries, they go crazy, they don't mm -hmm. know how to operate, but you give them, and they won't grow and they won't be creative. But if you give them appropriate boundaries and they feel that safety and security, now they can thrive, they can yeah. grow, they can prosper, they can develop their individuality, right? Yeah. So that boundary idea, it shows up in every aspect of science and technology yeah. and humanities. And, you know, it's like such an important idea. And that's, that is, you know, in, in the Pajot's work, that is a very, that's a critical element. Yeah. Yeah. And you the boundary has to be a certain kind of boundary. If it's a, if you, if I draw a work of art and I draw it with a Sharpie, 
and everything has this very, the same thickness of line around everything, very dark line. What do I have? I have a poster. Yeah. <laughs> right? I don't have something that the viewer can enter into with mm -hmm. me. I've just presented something to them, take it or leave it. What you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. But if my edges are soft and enticing and lead you around the painting and give you a journey, you, you can stand in front of a painting like that and you can let the wholeness of it yeah. enter into you, right? So the boundaries, the edges are super important. Would you say that, that the boundaries, um, say, say that, that you know, you're saying that the boundaries have to have a soft quality to them? Wouldn't not, that, not all of them, but yeah, okay. But, they, but w would you say that, that that quality means that there is potential for the boundaries to change and or be uh, permeable? Absolutely. I think, yeah. I think that the, um, okay, if I'm thinking about the big picture of the world in general, mm -hmm. I think the best world is a world in which each of us as individuals have voluntary, we put ourselves within voluntary boundaries, mm -hmm. but those boundaries are um, a little bit fuzzy, meaning yeah. that they have connecting points to other people's uh, edges, mm -hmm. and they're also permeable from within. We have doors that we can open and let yeah, others. Exactly. So that, so that permeability is a critical aspect of it because there isn't going to be any cre creativity if it's totally closed off. There has yeah. to be some permeability to it. Yeah. That, and and Piersik has this, um, this is actually in the other book, he has something that he calls the cultural, <clears throat> excuse me, the other book, Lila, one, one, um, one, um, way that he, you know, uses w w one way that he uses examples to express his his philosophy is through anthropology. There's a lot of anthropology in the second book, and he says, you know, the old style of anthropology is very objective, and and um, you you just are objective as you could possibly be as you you know write down with with what your um, your subject is doing, and you don't put any value into it. And he said the problem with that is just it becomes a lot of data, and he calls it the cultural immune system because the anthropology that uses that objectivity um, will not accept anything but that. So there's no way anything can get out, get in and transform that. And you have a very you have a very dead discipline that is stagnant, doesn't go anywhere, doesn't ultimately do much because it just can't be updated. And so. Um, that, that, that concept in his work of the cultural immune system are the rigid boundaries and how things within there just will, will stagnate and that will eventually kill whatever he calls it a pattern. You know, he would call that a, um, I, I guess that would be a, a, a social pattern. That would eventually is going to make this pattern irrelevant. And the only way that something like that can be updated is with something, you know, like it, like the Peugeot's Topsy Turvy World, for example. When something is that rigid, the only way it can actually be updated is to be destroyed. Well, so let me read you something from McGilchrist's book that I think is good. Is yeah, I've been getting a lot into his work a lot in, in you know, anticipation of talking to you. And I, I really, it's amazing the parallels I'm finding in there to Parasic. Okay, so this is towards the end. So the book is in two sections. The mm -hmm. first section is um, when he's talking about how the two hemispheres relate to each other and compete with each other and all of that. And then the second section, he's going to go into how that, how one side or the other being dominant at various times has affected world history, mm -hmm. where we are today. Yeah. I haven't read the second half yet. I'm at the end of the first half. Mm -hmm something he says at the end of the first half, which I thought was such a perfect picture. It's a paragraph, so bear with me. Sure. The feeling we have of experience happening that even if we stop doing anything and just sit and stare, time is still passing. Our bodies are changing. Our senses are picking up sights and sounds smells, and tactile sensations, and so on. That's an expression of the fact that life comes to us. Whatever it is out there that exists apart from us comes into contact with us 
in the same way as water falls on a particular landscape. The water falls and the landscape resists. One can see a river as restlessly searching out its path across the landscape, but in fact, no activity is taking place in the sense that there is no will involved. One can see the landscape as blocking the path of the water so that it has to turn another way. But again, the water just falls in the way that water has to, mm -hmm. and the landscape resists its path in the way that it has to. But the result of the amorphous water and the form of the landscape is a river. The river is not only passing across the landscape, but entering into it and changing it too, as the landscape has changed and yet not changed the water. The landscape cannot make the river. It does not try to put a river together. It does not even say yes to the river. The landscape merely says no to the water or does not say no to the water. And by not saying no to the water, whatever it is that it does, so it allows the river to come into being. The river does not exist before this encounter. Only water exists before the encounter. And the river actually comes into being in the process of encountering the landscape with its power to say no or not say no. Similarly, there is whatever it is that exists apart from ourselves, but whatever it is that exists only comes to be what it is as it finds out in the encounter with ourselves what it is. And we only find out and make ourselves what we are in our encounter with whatever it is that exists. Mm -hmm. So I tried to write that up in a very simple statement. The landscape might say, I have formed the river. And the river might say, I have formed the landscape. But without the falling water, there would be no river to begin with. <laughs> right? So that's the quality. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I'm really interested in talking with you about what that quality actually is, because I like what Piercing has to say, but I think he's he's not all the way there for me. I think he's part of the way there, mm -hmm. and partly there's some pieces missing. So, do you see quality in the same way that he sees it, or do you? Is it something more in your mind? Um, I find Piercing. Uh, one reason I am so enthusiastic about it is it does answer everything for me. Mm -hmm. So any so pretty much anything he said, I, I agree with. Um, one thing, well, quality itself, you know, in, in the book, and what's interesting about McGillcrest is, you know, I was looking at some of his stuff. Um, he's interested in these dynamic, um, uh, you could call them mystical traditions, Taoism, Zen, Sufism, the Christian mystics. Um, and so you're, that description of the river, of the, you know, the relationship between the fall, you know, I mean, the, the origin, the falling water, and then the relationship between the water and the land, very much that, that, that really illustrates um, one of the ways that people are going to describe the Tao. Mm -hmm. And in the book, um, when, when Phaedrus is trying to figure out what is quality, he thinks it's Tao. He can put in the word quality into the Tao Te Ching and it can replace the word, you know, almost with, with an almost perfect parallel. So um, that's, that's interesting in that sense because it is that force, that, that force that drives things on, you know, that, um, that makes things flow. You could say that is headed towards what's better, what is good. I think the difference um, for Piercig was that it's it's not as passive as all that. It's it's like um, because he's he's his work is very much a unification of East and West. He said that there is an element in it, you know, creative and improving element in it, which is why evolution happens. It's not just the circular, you know, harmony. There also has to be this this aspect of improvement. 
which is more of the Western thing. The harmony, et cetera, is more of the right brain. The improvement, you know, is more of the left brain. I mean, you're going to see, it's, it's, it's been so cool to look at McGilchrist, you know, um, by, and I'm grateful to you by your prompting, um, because it lays on to Piercing just so, so well. That, that right brain and left brain um, hemisphere elements. I mean, they just, they're, it, and they do what you say, you know, they, they interact with each other. Like, yes, that graphic, you know, in the RSA animation, where it is like a marriage, where they are constantly back and forth with each other. And um, so quality for him, among other things, but one, one thing that's really important, I think, to understanding Piercing is it's a harnessing, it's that force that is always there, that is toward um, what's better, what has more freedom, what's, you know, improvement. Um, and there's two elements. The first is the sensing of it, the right brain sensing of quality, and it's pre-intellectual. And then, I mean, you know, the, the pre-intellectual aspect of it is that omnipresent, always ever-present aspect of it. So the pre-intellectual quality is deterministic, let's just say. So the human brain will get this period intellectually, then it will manifest in the, in the right brain, you know, totality, understanding, and then the left brain helps manifest it. So you've got this, this, this exchange between the, the big gestalt picture, you know, what is quality? It's, you can't speak it. It's not articulate. It's not, you're not able to articulate it. It's, it's emotional, let's just say. I mean, emotional in the sense of, um, of value, of good. And then the left brain is where you were, are going to be able to manifest it in whatever way. And this is how quality, you know, he says that quality creates the world and this is how it does it. The, the, it, the quality um, is the stimulus. You have this recognition of quality in a value sense. And then you have the manifestation of quality in the left brain more you know rational sense where you actually are limited as a human being in the world and you have various ways you can manifest it you can use you know rhetoric you can you can write you can you can make a beautiful painting um you can uh you can you know make uh, mathematical equations fall into this too in the book you know in every in every aspect of human endeavor there is a way to um to manifest quality in the left brain kind of way and make it a pattern. So um, maybe I went off the rails a little bit, but, but that's how I see it. Well, um, so in the Torenberg thing, he says that um, Persig's breakthrough moment was quality is not a thing, it yeah. is an event. an event. Yeah. He says that first, but then he yeah. goes on to say, that quality is the point mm -hmm. at which subject and object mm -hmm. meet. Of course, all of this is language, right? So yeah. the minute you yeah. start trying to put something into language, you're using the left brain yeah. analytical side of yourself. The event at which awareness of both subjects and objects is made possible. Now he goes on to say, quality of any particular thing in here is neither in subject nor object, but in the relationship between mm -hmm. the two, the event at which awareness of both subjects and object is made possible. See, I'd like to make a little shift there because right. I don't think event actually gets at it. I think what actually gets at it because and of course, I'm coming from my own perspective. And it's the only perspective I know is my own perspective. But um, knowing something mm -hmm. is, is a relational experience. We can only know through the relationship. Mm -hmm. my, my senses are absorbing something from the atmosphere around me. And that is how I perceive anything through my senses. That's what, that's what gathers the information and brings it into the right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. The right hemisphere has a choice. It doesn't just accept everything. The mm -hmm. right hemisphere either, according to McGilchrist, the right hemisphere either says no or not no. Yeah. It either permits or doesn't permit. No. So the right hemisphere is exercising a choice as to what part of this experience it will allow in. Mm -hmm. 
and then gives that to the left hemisphere to work on. The left hemisphere works on that. But this initial foray, this initial, our, our fuzzy edges of our knowing that are out there connecting to whatever there is in the, in the universe around us that's bringing in this knowing, that's a relationship. So I would like to posit that the quality is not an event, but the quality is a person. A person in the sense of a person who wants to be in relationship with us. A, a person in the sense of a person who um, if you think of, uh, of a husband and wife contending with each other, competing with each other, pushing each other onward to something greater than the two alone can be, and then you think of the left and right hemisphere as that all, same picture, they're contending with each other, they're pushing each other to be greater than they, you know, either one can be alone. And then the person in relationship with this other is another, another picture of that same marriage. There is a marriage available to me and this person, this quality that is available that I can either say no or not mm -hmm. no. I can open my boundary to this person that is quality. Mm -hmm. Because in my conception, quality is, this person is simultaneously quality and truth and um, creative fidelity. Those are all one thing. I think mm -hmm. this idea of creative fidelity or, and I use the word creative fidelity because the word I actually want to use is love but love has been contaminated as a word. It no longer has the depth of meaning that is, is intended to be there. Agape love yeah. is this yeah. creative fidelity. I right? was just gonna suggest that's how we refer yeah. to it, yeah. Yeah, so agape quality, um, truth are all one thing. So, so mm -hmm. when you start to say, well, the classicists made a mistake because they put all the emphasis on truth. Well, no, I think that I think it is truth, but truth is not limited to the picture that they had of truth. That's right. They had, they had a limited picture of truth. That's right. They thought there was an ultimate truth. They thought that once you got up there and surveyed the landscape in heaven, you know, there, truth was there. It was fixed. You've seen it, and now you can bring it back down to heaven and make it, you know, make it like just to say a, a list of you know, like a list, a rigid way of seeing it. Yeah, so I drew a little picture for myself the other day when I was trying to think this thing through because in today's world, there's three different views of truth, I think. Mm -hmm. okay. None of them get at what truth actually mm -hmm. is, I don't think. On the one side, in, to the question, is there such a thing as truth? There are some people today who say no. Yeah. Everything's relative. Yeah. There's no truth. So you could say cultural relat uh, cultural relativism is that how cultural you would describe it? Yeah. Intersectionality, yeah, all of all that stuff yeah. rise out of this. There is no knowable truth. Postmodernism, yeah. too many options. Okay. Then the other the other side says yes, there is such thing as truth, absolute truth. Yeah. But that side breaks down into two two views. There's the scientific view. Truth is knowable. Yeah. We keep pursuing it and breaking everything down into the smallest possible components, mm -hmm. studying those things and analyzing them, we will finally find the truth. Yeah. And the quantum physicists have gotten themselves all the way down to these <laughs> tiniest little particles right, <laughs> to find the truth. And then there's the, the religious system view, mm -hmm. systematic religious view, of which there are several in the world that mm -hmm. say, oh, we've found the truth. This, our system represents the truth. Mm -hmm. This is absolute truth. If you follow this absolute truth, then you will know the truth. Okay, that's a systematic view. Yeah. And I think all of that is incorrect. Yeah, I agree with you. There is an absolute truth, but it's above everything else. Mm -hmm. It's not the top of the hierarchy. It's above the top of the hierarchy. And, and the only way to approach is, you know, like Paul Vanderclay always uses this term, um, 
further in, further in and higher, further in and higher up. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's, it's the picture of calculus of the asymptote always approaching but never meeting. And as you draw closer, you're always getting closer, 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 but you can mm -hmm. never meet because you're always striving up towards. Yeah. And it's that striving up that draws the quality up because if you think you've found truth, that stops all forward motion. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah. That okay. makes a lot of sense. Um, one thing that, you know, a, a, a way to look at it, I guess, in secular terms is, um, is that, um, Pearson was very influenced by William James. Mm -hmm. So that pragmatic notion of truth, which is the one that Jordan Peterson, you know, um, one thing that made me very interested in Jordan Peterson is that truth is what is the highest quality at the moment, basically is what he's saying. Well, I, when I was listening to this conversation that he was having with Matthew and Jonathan Pajot, mm -hmm. The conclusion that they all three came to, which which I completely agree with, is that when when you come and and language always fails us, but yeah, that's true. I'm thinking about why do we say when you come face to face with reality, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we say that yeah, you have to face up to reality, you have to turn into it, you mm -hmm. have to look at it, let it look at you. That's, we have a relationship with reality. Mm -hmm. when, when, when our actions align with reality, that's the truth. <laughs> and um, so, so there's some way, I, 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 I still haven't worked it all out, but I keep wondering if truth and reality and quality and love, and if they're not all one thing. I think maybe, you know, I think they, they might be because I think that you know it when it happens. And I think that this is what I really like about what Jordan Peterson said is, you know, when you're telling the truth and when you're not. So that sense of, and that could also, you could, you know, you could look at that. Let's just say if quality is a person, when is the relationship, when does it feel like agape? Mm -hmm. and, and I do think that that feeling, that sense, which I would say is, a, is the awareness of quality as well, I think they are the same thing. So that type of truth is just, I guess, you know, using the constraints of language, another way to describe this, you could say phenomenon, you could say relationship, you could say event, you know. Mm -hmm. This, this experience of connecting, you know, when subject you meet that and you, are, you become in relation because it absolutely feels right, let's just say. It's what absolutely feels right. Well, of course, the, there's, a, there's such a danger though in letting, and that's why, I guess that's why we have two hemispheres. Yeah. <laughs> Everything relies on what feels right. I mean, that's how we got into trouble in the 60s and 70s, right? Right. Well, I, I don't mean feels right in that sense because what you're because that's that's what feels. Let's 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 reintroduce the boundary then. Let's reintroduce mm -hmm. that. You know what what it what feels right within. Yeah, that's a difficult one. I know what you're saying. No, I, I totally agree. It's not what feel if it feels good, do it. It's what feels. Let's just say not right in the biological sense, but feel but feels the most, could you say meaningful? Could you say transcendence? There's a feeling right that, that maybe we need to identify that isn't on the biological level. It's yeah. on every level. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing we have to yeah. identify because yeah. it's so hard to pinpoint how to describe that thing. Yeah. And you know, we say meaning, but how do we know? Now, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about how you know you've found meaning when everything lines up. Yeah. When you're listening to a piece of music and all the pieces fall into place and all of a sudden you're just transported because everything has lined up. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll hear somebody say something and all of a sudden I can just feel all the tumblers lock mm -hmm. into place and it's like, <laughs> and I get this big picture, right? Right. <clears throat> and, I think those are the moments yeah. when we maybe come close 
not that we can ever maybe apprehend, we can never fully apprehend, <clears throat> but, but we have those moments where we come <clears throat> a little bit close to it, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I think the the trouble that we have, of course, is because something like that is so there there isn't a way to put it into words. There isn't I, there isn't an adequate word to describe it that isn't going to leave out some element. Well, and the other thing that gets in the way, one of the things Matthew Pajot was talking about is that he sees these these two big paradigms you're either inhabiting the land mm -hmm. or you're in exile mm -hmm. and when you're in exile you're serving the stranger when you're inhabiting the land you are you are aligned with quality and truth i guess mm -hmm. you might say it but when yeah. you're in exile and you're no longer aligned with quality and truth the way Bob Dylan used to say it, you know, <laughs> you to serve somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're not serving truth, you're serving somebody else. It may be some, mm -hmm. some psychological aberration in your own mind that you're mm -hmm. serving. You may be serving some physical need that takes you over and you get addicted to some aspect or another of your physical you know, all the things that we can get addicted to. We can get addicted to the internet or, mm -hmm. or to, you know, physical pleasure or food or alcohol or whatever. You, you're going to end up in service to one of those things if you're not aligned with truth. And so because we're so susceptible to all those physical experiences, it's very easy to mistake something that feels right in that physical domain with what is truth. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, the old songs used to come right from, you know, you know, it, when it feels right, you know, I just know that it's true. I, you, I know you're the one because it feels right. Mm -hmm. And so we're in, in, in a sense, McGilchrist makes this pretty clear in that we lie to ourselves, our brain, one side of our brain will lie to the other side of our brain. <laughs> You know, it's very tricky <laughs> because we tell each other, we, our, the, the two hemispheres of our brain will tell each other stories mm -hmm. because, partly because they have a, a strong need to remain independent and rightly so. The two hemispheres, the left hemisphere with the focus and mm -hmm. the, the ability to construct and build and, and, uh, manifest that needs to mm -hmm. have its focus like if if i get my husband to come out and help me with the yard work and then i start suggesting to him how to do it mm -hmm. that's the end of the yard work <laughs> he's, not, he's, he's targeted he's on it but if i come and interfere with his focus he's not going to do it anymore yeah, you pull so that, out of the flow state, I guess. Huh? Yeah, so, so <laughs> when, when that focus is there, it has to be able to work on its own without being interfered with. Mm -hmm. but, but if it goes on too long that way by itself, it may go off on you know, the wrong bunny trail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that makes sense. Our technological, you know, we've, we've built the Tower of Babel out of technology. That is very true. Yeah, and that's certainly a problem that we're seeing now. Yeah, um, I think you're really going to enjoy. Are, are you Are you going to read um, the master? Yeah. Well, I've I've looked at I've started looking at his stuff, and um, one thing that's really interesting. I mean, we were talking about this, you know, this idea of truth, you know, the Platonic idea of truth. Um, that I suppose, in, in according to Piercig, Aristotle kind of codified. Um, McGilchrist says that, he, he says the same thing as Piercig, which is it's the pre-Socratics who had that balance between both hemispheres. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in Piercig, of course, that's going to be that, they, um, that their, their reality was arite, excellence. Mm -hmm. which is, you know, very much like quality before it was. And then, you know, in, in chapter 29, you can see 
the, the mechanisms in which Plato um, subverted that, let's just say subverted truth, uh, allowed, you know, made truth logos over mythos rather than vice versa, which it actually is. And um, so I found that very interesting in McGilchrist that he came to the, exactly the same conclusion that Piersick does about where the problem began. Or at least like for McGilchrist, I guess it's two or three times in history, but, but in that particular time that happens. Yeah, um, and I'm, I'm always, well, how do I put this? <clears throat> this is a complicated idea, but let's go back to the river and the riverbank. Mm -hmm. There's a scripture that says something like, um, God can change the heart of the king just as he can change the course of a river. Meaning nothing is too hard for God. Yeah. But <clears throat> because changing someone's heart is impossible for another person to do. Of course, yeah. A person's heart is only going to do what it's going to do. And, 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 you know. Yeah. But how does a river course change? The only way the course of a river ever changes is if there's some cataclysmic event. Uh, yeah. There's a flood mm -hmm. or, or, you know, or an earthquake. The course of a river will change. And sometimes in the course of a human heart, it requires some kind of cataclysmic event. I think that's very true. Yeah. For a heart to change, right? And <clears throat> so I think... Yes, there is a sense in which maybe we strayed after Plato and got off too much into this um, left hemisphere thing. But at the same time, I also like what Jordan Peterson says when he says, let's not scoff at what has been built. Mm -hmm. Let's not lack gratitude for what has been built around here. I mean, all these, all these scientists and, and engineers and laborers and and telephone wire stringers and and plumbers and all these people who have done all of these things to mm -hmm. create this world around us this world of comfort that we live in yeah, let, yeah let's look at it with gratitude yeah and even where it may have gone off the rails something has come of that mm -hmm. and there's something to be learned from it and so we can we can um uh, we can see the looming catastrophe, but that can also be a, a pointer. It it's a, can be a good thing showing us what needs to be done. It's yeah. not necessarily that that is like all bad. Yeah, I, don't, I agree with you. I don't have an apocalyptic vision of this, which, which you know, I think a lot of people kind of do, probably because they're thinking so left brain. <laughs> I, I do think that these kind of, you know, these, these wake up moments like what we're in now where you could say that right now is not necessarily what's happening is bad. What's happening is things are shifting dramatically and it is cataclysmic and, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily going in a bad direction. What it's doing is um, it's, 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 it's allowing, it's a cataclysm that's allowing us to evolve. It's allowing us to change the course of the river. And I think that that's a very interesting point, what you're making. You can't say, well, just because, Plato came in and said logos is more important than mythos, you know, or it's dominant over mythos. Um, maybe we needed that to get to the point that we have the luxury of even thinking about this stuff. You know, we're not slogging through the mud, you know, trying to find, trying to save our crops and, and that kind of thing. We are so, and, and this is the, you know, it's getting to be the world over. It's getting to be even, you know, Africa. We're so, um, secure we've conquered because of this the world to such an extent that now and and the outcome is you know we've lost meaning we've lost connectivity to the land mm -hmm. but in fact you actually are in a situation where you have you're in, you're in the you know you're in the luxurious luxurious position of becoming a philosopher again and through that philosophy you know and and this is one thing Pierce definitely pointed out is you don't discount technology in that philosophy you use the philosophy to engage with technology in the best possible way for example you know um you you have a situation where technology has just really destroyed 
environmentally things really badly. But at the same time, you've got technologies on the horizon that will be able to do what the more destructive technologies did without the destruction. You know, you're going to be able to have energy sources that don't pollute, that, create, that, that provide the energy without any pollution. So it's just like this evolving, um, if you're looking at it in the big picture, which is evolution towards what's better, then this cataclysmic situation we're in, which is just such a mixed bag, kind of makes sense. And it also makes sense not to discount 2,000 years of technology. Yeah. And, and I would also say, let me, let me input two things here. Um, there have been, throughout the centuries, there have been those who have come along who have had insights that they brought in that have provided some balance. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I have not ever been a student of philosophy or yeah, I never studied any of these things until I <laughs> started hearing Gordon Peterson speak and started following everything I could find. Pretty much but you I and me both. <laughs> really playing catch up. Yeah, yeah. And I just explored the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas mm -hmm couple of days ago by listening to a, a few um, YouTubes about kind of uh, summary of his mm -hmm. teaching. And I thought, wow. So he was one of those hinge points in history where he brought back in some of this balance. So you might want to just listen to a, a YouTube video about Thomas Aquinas because it, it's just wonderful the way he brings back in this balance. And, and so in the church, there's been this big debate between mm -hmm. Aquinas and um, my mind just went blank, um, the city of God, Augustine. Mm -hmm. Augustine and Aquinas are apparently like two sides or something. Mm -hmm. so, so, that, so that has created a balance where there's been this continual, have to have this discussion between these two points of view. Right. I think we have the same thing in science where today we have the scientists, we also have the philosophers of science, mm -hmm. where they're always looking at these two points of view. The other thing that I think that keeps me from thinking apocalyptically is um, when I was, uh, in 1980, I was elected to be a state representative in the state of Iowa. Mm -hmm. So like a state version of a congressperson. Right. And because of that, I got a, a um, My brain must be tired. I got some money, a scholarship. I got a scholarship to go to a an economic seminar on uh, Austrian economics up in upstate New York. And there was a wonderful professor of economics there who was just an amazing teacher. And he and he said this in 1980. He said, "There's all this fear right around right now about scarcity." and um, the world is coming to an end and we should mm -hmm. have zero population growth and there's you know this looming um, global cooling that was the big thing back then mm -hmm. the world is going to come apart because of global cooling yeah. and there's not enough food for everybody and we're going to have overpopulation and he said but every time that we come to a point like that in our civilization where that kind of fear has risen to the surface there is a huge breakthrough technology yep. Yep. and he looked back to mm -hmm. the industrial revolution mm -hmm. he looked back to the steam engine he looked back to you know the beginning of worldwide transportation he said something's coming he said yep. i don't know what it is but something's coming well i mean he was right before the internet revolution and, and the personal computer revolution right which opened up all sorts of resources planet wide yeah to to more appropriate distribution of resource and yep. all of that. Well, I think that same thing is true, you know, that everybody's fearful right now, something terrible, you know, we're in this mm -hmm. apocalyptic world, but something is coming. I think the thing is, though, that we need to consider these principles that are very, very important. And did you see the movie The Circle? No. I had never watched it because I thought, you know, cheesy, cheesy apocalyptic vision movie. I'm not going to watch it. 
but somebody recommended it to me the other day. So we pulled it up and we rented it and, mm -hmm. and watched it. And it, uh, if you're going to watch it, I won't tell you the end, but if you're not going to watch it, I'll tell you the end. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's this girl that works for a, a company that's similar to a Google uh -huh. book. And, uh, and they convince everybody that somehow it would be a good thing if this congressman wears a camera 24 seven so that their life is completely exposed mm -hmm. and, and their complete transparency and how it would be great if everybody in government was completely transparent mm -hmm. as we could see all their papers and everything. That's the first step. The second step is that they get one of the girls in the company to wear this camera and to accept the fact that if she wears a camera and if everywhere she goes, there's a camera, she won't fall into rules and breaking laws because she'll know that she's being watched. Mm -hmm. And so that will protect her from herself. So she starts to wear a camera. And, and then you think she's gonna wake up, right? You get this idea, oh, she's gonna wake up and know that this is bad. Mm -hmm. But so the kind of trick at the end is to think, oh, she's waking up because then she, she convinces the whole company, hey, these two leaders of the company, let's let them be radically transparent and start wearing a camera. Mm -hmm. So all of their machinations are exposed. And then you think, okay, now the company's going to stop. Now she becomes the head of the company and leads everybody into this radical transparency. So the whole world is now going to be watched everywhere they go mm -hmm. and wearing a camera everywhere they go. And the minute I saw that ending, I thought immediately, this is really bad because what it's saying is that nobody has any boundaries anymore. And what happens when you have no boundaries? If you have no boundaries, everything dissipates. It's like, yeah, it took the, you know, it's like letting the gas out of some opening the box. It just mm -hmm. all dissipates. You lose all creativity yeah. and dynamism and forward movement. And, and so I thought, well, it's a good thing that's not going to happen. Then I got into a discussion with somebody on a YouTube thread who was suggesting this kind of radical transparency as the solution to our problems today. Mm. And I said, haven't you seen the circle? <laughs> and he said, yes, I think it's a very important work that's showing the way forward. Oh my goodness. And this guy is a tech guy and very interested in the whole AI thing and how AI right. is going to work out. Well, if the tech people are thinking that is a path yeah, forward, yeah. wow, wow, that is not good. No, that's not good. And I think you've, 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 you know, like hit on a really important point, which is if this is the next step, which it is, it's got to have a, a foundation of, let's just say that foundation has to be informed by this thing we're talking about. Quality, agape, you know, this relational, and, and this is, uh, this is going to be very hard for me to articulate, but it, it seems to me that this principle that you and I are trying to, you know, define, which we can't define, has to be the basis for any major shift that comes next. Otherwise, it is going to be off kilter. Otherwise, it is going to, you know, go on a path that's going to be off. It's not going to be the quality path. Mm -hmm. And it might end up something, you know, like the balance will be totally off in, in this case that it, it will just... Uh, be the opposite of, of rigidity. It'll be no, it will be no boundaries, no creativity, nothing. It will just be a big um, amorphous mass of, of, of I, I don't know what the word is. It reminds me of when Pajot says, you know, that the, the, the topsy-turvy world where it's just like anything goes. Mm -hmm. Well, if I go back to uh, Torenberg's uh, summary of mm -hmm. the Christigs, he says, he argues that all, although rational thought may find a truth or the truth, uh -huh. that truth may never be fully and universally applicable to each and every individual's experience. Right. 
therefore, and here's where I kind of diverge from him. He says, therefore, what is needed is an approach to viewing life that is more varied and inclusive and has a wider range of application. Okay. Plato dismissed the sophists as teachers of ethical relativism, but Phaedrus finds this to be a piece of propaganda. But I do think that that kind of ethical relativism is the danger of, I think it's an error to say that the truth is not fully and universally applicable to each and every individual's experience. And here's why I say this. Uh -huh. Because if you think of truth as something static mm -hmm. and crystallized and a system, yes, it's not universally applicable to every person. But if you think of the truth as a person mm -hmm. who is radically committed to my best flourishing, my most creative individual growth that I can most fully manifest the potential that was placed in me at the beginning of my existence. Mm -hmm. If that is the essence of truth, then that truth is universally applicable to every person because mm -hmm. it, it has a, that truth has a vested interest in seeing the most, um, the most manifesting of that potential in each yeah. individual. Yeah. And, and where I see this picture in um, in the way things play out is especially in the picture of calculus. Mm -hmm. Because calculus says, yes, there is a solution, but the only it's an intractable problem. The only way you can find the solution is to divide it into an infinity of pieces. Mm -hmm. Each piece is completely unique and different, and there's no connection in all the pieces are different sizes and weight, mm -hmm. whatever. But, but through calculus, it is possible to divide it into all these pieces and then integrate it back together again into a whole. Mm -hmm. And it's, so there's always this principle of the one and the many. Yeah. Right? This unity yeah. and yeah. diversity are the same thing. They're not they're not two different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's well, and in, in, and in the sense that you know, if we're talking quality, quality is going to be where it needs to be at the moment, and it might be unity, it might be diversity. So the so the underlying so so how we would divide it up in the subject object way of looking at things and the left way of looking at things is unity, diverse, diversity, or or uh, one and many. But really, the thing that's guiding all this is what do we need right now? And that's, that is more what we're looking at is that underlying thing, that underlying mechanism that tells us where to go, that tells us yes or not yes, or, or no and not no, let's just say. Well, and, and if the, as long as the branch is connected to the tree, then diversification is a good thing. That mm -hmm. means the tree is still growing. It's yeah, still branching, absolutely. it's still diversifying, as long as the branch is connected to the tree. But if the branch gets disconnected from yeah. the tree, the diversifying becomes meaningless, becomes yeah. um, dead. It, it's like, you, like diversification, fragmentation can look like the same things, but they're not. Yeah. I love talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, <laughs> there, we there's, there were, there's a lot of common interests we share. Yeah. yeah. And, and what I wanted to say is now I really, you know, now that you just described that, you know, the person completes you is what you're saying. Quality completes you. The thing, the thing this principle we're talking about, you, it, it completes well, you it, and makes you grow. Yes. Um, well, let me, let me share with you. There's this, there's this, Bible verse that says that God knows your frame and he knows that you are but dust. And I got interested in that verse and I thought, huh, dust sounds a lot like quantum particles. Mm -hmm. I wonder what that says in the Greek or the, the, now I can't remember if it was the Greek or the Hebrew, or whether it's Old or New Testament, but I went back and I looked up the words in the original language. And the word frame 
has the meaning of intention or plan, almost like a, an architectural plan or a wireframe mm -hmm. that needs to be fleshed out or filled mm -hmm. with being becoming manifest. Yeah. Right? And yeah. you know that you are but dust. You are this little pile of sand. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? But but inside that pile of sand, like I said, there's all this, it's like, if we look at the construction of the universe as being quantum particles, mm -hmm. it's all just little bits. You look, if you could look through a microscope at it, mm -hmm. it would be completely meaningless to us. But look what is made out of it. Right. Those quantum particles live at the atomic level, at the molecular level, at the wow. cellular level, at the, the body level, right? So, so he knows our frame and he knows that we are but dust, but mm -hmm. he has an intention or a plan. Yeah. So he is the source, like Piercing talks about this source, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He's the source, but he is also the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Yes. So he's this person yes. that is the source that gave us what we, gave us the, the material reality that we inhabit was a gift from him. We take it in and we make it even more because he has made each one of us a unique individual with unique capacities. We make it more and it becomes more in us. And then he fulfills, he completes it. So he's the source yeah. and the completer, right? Yeah. And, and that should be the picture of a marriage as well. That and makes sense. And, and you know what that also, is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that that should be the picture of marriage. It should be the picture of, of the, the, the uh, seed impregnating the woman and becoming a child. Yeah. Those, it's the same picture always. It's, it's the, always the same picture, picture. absolutely. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. Like, like do, you, do you like Cynthia Bergeau? Um, she's a, oh, she's a Episcopal minister, but she's a mystic. And she had this, she had this book. Um, she, if you know Richard Rohr, it's sort of that group I've heard his name and I've yeah. run into videos, but I haven't explored any of them yet. So. Well, she had a book called uh, The Holy, I think it's, it's something Trinity. But anyway, it was like, it was that whole mechanism, like you're saying, there's two things that create a third that transcends. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, like, like um, I mean, I know it's, I know it's a, a, a principal way before her, but that's, that's how I heard about it. And I wish I could remember the name of the book. It's really, it was good. But, um, but the whole thing about, you know, yeah, that, that child is, that's a perfect example of this mechanism, the husband and the wife and the child to create this. Well, I'm going to show you, so can, is it visible? Uh, yeah. Probably backwards. Wife, okay. Yeah. I see it. Probably no, backwards. it's not backwards. No. Okay. So husband, wife, and God at the top. The only reason I show you that picture is a very simple way to think about it is that as the husband and wife draw closer to the the one, the mm -hmm. quality, the truth, the yeah. real, you know, God, yeah. they are simultaneously drawing closer to each other. Yeah. So the greatest union that the husband and wife can have is when they're the closest to God. That makes sense. And that would be true with the hemispheres of our brain. Yeah. The union between the two is going to be most effective and most powerful and most dynamic and most yeah. creative when it's closest to the one. Mm -hmm. When it's driven by quality. Yeah. I, I know what I was going to say now. So um, with the Pajot brothers, this is what's so cool about Jonathan Pajot's practice, which I, which, you know, which is why I think like people will say, well, he's in a traditional thing and it's dogmatic or whatever. I, I don't think so. What I think is what he's doing, what his practice in, in Orthodox Christianity is very much like what you're talking about. There's the structure and God makes it manifest. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what I really love about, you know, and, and Matthew's book is you've got this underlying structure and it's, and it's kind of eternal. At least it's eternal in the sense that, um, the, the, we also have our limitations as human beings. We're going to have the experiences we can have as human beings. And now we're a certain iteration of human beings that have evolved in this way. Our consciousness is thus. And therefore, within this constraint, not maybe an eternal principle per se, but within this 
constraint of our human experience, you have this hierarchical, you have these patterns that, um, that Matthew lays out. I, I'm not, I don't know if they're eternal patterns. I don't know if they're patterns that seemingly eternal because we're human beings with our experience. But, um, but it's like every time they go, you know, every time you go to church in that tradition, Christ becomes incarnate, I think. That's, what, that's my understanding. And so the pattern like repopulates every time and I'm sure that, that this isn't just in Orthodox Christianity. It just so happens that it's laid out because of the Peugeot brothers in that regard. It's like you've got this pattern, it's internal pattern, and every time you worship, it becomes incarnate. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's something like the, um, the uh, trans, Mary, Mary corrected me on this, trans, you know, when you, when you have the, the uh, host, you take the host and... Oh, in Catholic theology... Yeah the transubstantiation transubstantiation yeah it's like there's a pattern and it's ancient and and it's in our what what uh, what Pearson would call the mythos maybe um um Jung would call it the collective unconscious it's it's always there and then it becomes manifest in this worship so mm -hmm. that's what that reminded me of of what you were talking about well yeah and, and just on the very the very most fundamental level um where two or more are gathered mm -hmm. in my name i'm with yeah. you right yeah. so so um where, I, where there's potential for a relationship it's, because there's yeah. got to be two or more yeah, yeah. and Actually, so I mean, I think the the way that that was made concrete for me was um, listening to a guy who had been a missionary in India for 30 years, I mm -hmm. think. And he said whenever he would go into a household, um, he would always ask them if he could pray for them. And people are always willing to have you pray for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he would pray. And, and he said that because they had no, they didn't have all the same filters that we have in our culture, mm -hmm. where we have a certain expectation that we are going to be sophisticated and we understand everything and therefore mm -hmm. everything is concrete reality. But when he was in those villages talking to those folks, they didn't have that set of expectations. And when he would pray, they would say, oh, there's someone here with us. Mm -hmm. They could immediately sense a presence yeah. in the room, right? And um, I think that presence is always there, mm -hmm. but we have our buffers out. We have our hard boundaries, our hard we left brain. <laughs> right? We don't have our fuzzy edges yeah, yeah. ready to pick it up. Right. So. Yeah, I think I think a lot of spiritual practice really, I mean, certainly looking at it from you know, if you're looking at it from a mystical tradition, which I'm more familiar with, which is why I keep going back to that. But, but I certainly see it in what I'm learning about um, Christianity, just re rediscovering my own uh, family past and from listening to you and Mary and Paul, Jonathan, um, is that I think a lot of these spiritual practices are trying to strengthen the right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because some of them, I mean, from what um, from what Peterson says, they know that some of these psychedelics actually mm -hmm. inhibit the left yeah. hemisphere. So that, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So that would open up the right hemisphere. Yeah. The danger, I think, with the psychedelics is that if so, the the left hemisphere has a, a is a limiting principle. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a limiting principle, then, then you're, you, you don't have boundaries. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any boundaries at all, it's very easy for you to just disappear yeah. into, this, um, into this other world and never come back. I think that happens, that to, happens people. to some people. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. and I think that the only way you could really reliably use it, psychedelics for your benefit is to do it within, and, and this is happening, of course, in the psychotherapy world. There's actually, through the um, uh, MAPS um, organization, 
there's a protocol being developed. So if you're going to do psychedelics to, you know, say, because it's very effective for PTSD and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got this protocol where the people keep you grounded in your, in your trip and your experience. So you don't go off and start going out of context and then thinking that there's this alternate reality and coming back with that, you know, an alternate reality that, that isn't grounded, that's outside the mythos, let's just say. It's, they keep you within the mythos. Mm -hmm. That was the whole thing that happened in Inception with his wife, right? Did yeah. Did you ever see that movie? Oh, Inception? Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't see it. Oh, okay. Well, Inception is about a technology that allows a dream to go inside a dream, inside a dream, oh, wow. to, to, um, to incept an idea into another person's mind, mm -hmm. to build, to create a, a reality in their mind that you want there for some reason. Mm -hmm. And, and th these people were using this technology. But um, one of the guys had gotten down to the third level of the, you know, in, in creating the technology, he had had to go down to the third level himself mm -hmm. with his wife, who was also creating the technology with him. Mm -hmm. But she got lost there, could never come back. Right. When she did finally come back into this world, she brought that world with her. So she mm -hmm. thought that was the reality, not the reality she was in. And uh, she thought the only way she could get back to the reality that she'd come from was to kill herself. So that's right. what she did because she wanted back to that reality so badly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, and that's a really good point. And I think you do need something. I mean, for all the benefits of this experience, from what I understand, and the clinical evidence is pretty robust because this is NIH, you know. Right. Um, and some of these some of these things like PTSD and there's certain things that especially with early childhood stuff that is so impenetrable that you mm -hmm. actually need a restructuring of, you know, you need actually to get back to the structure of your humanity. Right. and get rid of this stuff so 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 i can't I believe that there is, you have to get to a place where you believe there is something good that's right where right. you are essentially untouched by all these terrible things that have happened to you and that mm -hmm. psychedelics can do that but but they could also put you in a direction of um you know the opposite direction so i think i think what you need to do really is is if you're going to do it you have to do it in some kind of supervised context yeah yeah. And there's, you know, you've got the, the Western way, which is this protocol they're developing. And, you know, um, and you've also got the, the traditional ways, which is with the shamans, and they still do that. So have you ever um, done any research on this electroshock therapy that they use sometimes with people who have severe depression? Is it actually helpful? Well, I think it's the same principle. I think it's that resetting. The trouble is, my what I've seen with people that I mean, if if the if the depression is just so intractable, I think it can be a lifesaver in certain situations. And there's a guy who does a TED talk that says this is the only thing that worked, and he was like a, a MD who's. Um, but the problem with that is there's a lot of side effects, and one of them is memory loss. Hmm. And you know, Peters has terrible memory loss in this book. He he gets it back, but I don't know if everyone does. I mean, I've I've met people who've had it, and they have they 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 have permanent memory damage. So I don't know. I mean, if if it was like the difference between suicide and ECT, yeah, I'd pick definitely ECT. Mm -hmm. So, but but I do think it is that same mechanism of resetting. So, yeah. Why don't we? Uh, let's see. How do you? How would you like to wind up? Well, I think it would be fun to figure out what we want to talk about next time because I think there's still a lot more to plumb here. Yeah. Well, maybe we can, I mean, I, I just love what I've learned about McGill, Chris. You know, people have been bugging me about this, but, but you're the person who got me to actually look at it. And, and now, the, the thing is, I don't know if you find this, but when you get into something, do you just want to get into that sometimes? I mean, sometimes, you know, you can go down different routes and you can learn that way. But like with Pearson, I, I have this sense, and which is why I've kind of pulled back in my channel and just been doing the reading is like, I've, I've felt like I've got to get such a handle on it first before I can go back and, um, and uh, really, I, I felt like I really needed to 
when I was doing this, I felt like I'm so insufficient in my understanding of this that I've got to go, I got to go straight for a sick before I can go back. And now I'm reaching the end of the book. I think I've got a lot of stuff. And now it was the perfect timing for McGillicrest. Yeah. Well, it's in the last two years, um, I've, I've looked at a lot of different things, mm -hmm. but the, the three books that I have focused in on the most um, would be Maps of Meaning. Yeah. I went through that. I mean, I just dug into it as deep yep. as I could go. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, um, and then, of course, 12 Rules for Life. Mm -hmm. And then this McGillchrist book. Um, and in between there was um, something else, which escapes my memory right now. But when I when I start reading something like that, because for some reason, I don't know if it's that, I don't know if it's that the books are very difficult for me, mm -hmm. or if it's that I'm a little bit, I'm like Paul, I'm a little ADD. So mm -hmm. I can read one sentence and, and I have 15 different ideas about where that takes me. Mm -hmm. So I have to take a lot of notes as I yeah. read, try yeah, to organize my thinking. So it takes me a long time to read through. So every morning I, I spend probably two or three hours and I might get two, five pages. It I get long, it. It takes me, me a long time to read something. And then I try not to just spend all day reading that because my brain gets fed by all these different random synchronicities that come at me during the day, living my life and talking to people and listening to Paul's videos and your videos and just things kind of filter in. I sort of let my right brain just absorb. And then in the morning, I get my two or three hours of left brain really trying mm -hmm. to understand this thing. But meanwhile, I have all this other fodder that fits in there. It, it makes it a richer experience for me. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think that's a really great way to do it. For some reason, I didn't do it with Peterson. I went full Peterson when I read that book. And that's mm -hmm. Peterson, Peterson, Peterson. That's all it was. Now I'm, I've been doing that with Peersick. Now that I'm getting to the end of the book, I can get back into the corner, which I've missed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, I ran into uh, an author the other day named Annette Poisner, mm -hmm. who is a therapist, and um, she has a doctorate in counseling psychology, but mm -hmm. she's, not, uh, she's not a clinical psychologist, mm -hmm. but she is a therapist. Mm -hmm. And um, she really got into Peterson a few years ago and has ended up writing four books, taking Peterson's ideas and trying to make them accessible. That's good. As therapeutic tools. And she's absolutely fascinating and so fun to talk to because she really, and she's kind of on the mystic, she's on the mystic Jewish yeah. side of things. Oh, interesting. Right. So she has that whole perspective to bring in. She's yeah. into the Chinese five element theory. Yeah. I think that would work. Yeah, I th I think it would be great for the two of you to talk. I think so. Maybe the what's, three of us could have a conversation. That would be great. What's <laughs> what's her name? I'm going to look up her work. Annette Poisner. Okay. P O I Z N E R. Her books are on Amazon. Okay, great. And um, she also has quite a few articles on Medium. Good. Yeah. She's and and she was saying that she's really encouraging people who have had a good experience because of the work of Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. that they should get out there and write articles and try to publish their experience because the people who have benefited from his teaching need to be writing his history yeah. and not these other people writing his history. Yeah, because the problem with the therapeutic community is we tend, you know, the community tends to be very liberal. So Peterson in the therapeutic community is ill-regarded. You know, we're talking about, we're she talking about, that. huh? She discovered that when yeah. she tried to, when she first got excited about him, she tried to send a link yeah. to something of his to her therapeutic community. Yep. And they really lambasted her. Yeah, but yeah, the same thing. The very similar thing happened to me. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really a pity because, um, you know, first of all, it's ignorant. And then secondly, it's, um, it's, 
there is so much useful stuff in Peterson for getting better, for helping your patients get better. No question. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll set up something for the three of us to do. That would be lovely. Yeah. And if it would be okay with you, I'd like to post this talk on my channel as well. Of course. So I'll guess I'll, um, did you record it on your end? You didn't record it? No, I'm recording it. Did you record oh. it on your end? <laughs> did you record no, I, it? On I, I didn't know I could record it on my end. So Okay, so I'll have to send you a file, which I'm sure I can figure out how to do. Yeah, I didn't, I, I should have realized that I could have recorded it on my side. Yeah, I think we both can. I think we both can. But yeah, um, yeah so I'll, I'll definitely do that and we'll both post it. Okay, so so yeah, that would be great. You know, that was one way we can go. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we can continue to talk about. Yeah, and and I also think there's a whole lot more in this um, McGilchrist stuff that doesn't come across in the summaries. I know he put together yeah. a kind of a summary essay that he was selling on Amazon for a dollar. Mm -hmm. Kind of is his idea about how it has affected history, mm -hmm. but. Um, I think that that kind of causes people to gloss over his neuropsychological research that went mm -hmm. into this book. And so yeah. they tend to look at it very simplistically. And there's really just so much more here about the way that the two hemispheres function with each other that I think deserves looking at. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably like the same thing. You know, you can't just read a synopsis of Piersig or or Peterson and get the whole thing. So, yeah, I mean, and now that I'm kind of coming to an end of this thing where I have to obsess totally over Pierce again, I can actually try to, uh, you know, integrate in what I've learned into the world. I mean, I'll, I, I got to go in the Lila direction, though. But <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to do that one online, too? I'm, I, I think what I'm going to do, I, um, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do that. There's much less resources for that. So I think I have an idea of what I might do but I'm not sure yet. But what I definitely want to do is, is start doing what, what um, Annette Posner did for uh, Peterson with Piercic. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a tall order. It's going to be challenging. I'm sure it was challenging for her to do this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and I would love to take this idea that I have of the elements and principles of design and how they fit into... Yeah. How, how we should be making decisions about the future because it, this is, it's the structure of reality. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not incidental that those things fit so well in the structure of reality. Yeah. And, uh, but it's very difficult for me to rein it in. It's like such a, it's such a monster. It's got, I mean, not in the sense it has lots of arms and legs. And yeah, I know. <laughs> I guess we have to eat our elephants one bite at a time. <laughs> I, I used to have this thing I'd use in teaching that if you have to eat a frog, eat it quickly. If you have more than one frog to eat, eat, eat it, eat the biggest one first. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. All right, Karen, it's been great to talk to you, meet you and talk to you. And this will be one of, you know, we're going to just keep going. Okay, sounds good. Thank All you. right. You take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.